Welcome. Good evening and welcome everyone to another Uncle Bobby's virtual author event. Thank you all for tuning in. We have a really special treat for you tonight. Toshi Onyabuchi is here with us, whose new book, Rebel Sisters, has debuted today. It's the eagerly awaited sequel to War Girls. Uh, if you haven't already, please order your copy of Rebel Sisters by clicking on the green button below the screen, supporting your local Black-owned bookstore. You know how we do after the discussion, um, we're gonna open up the floor to questions from the audience. So please feel free to submit those using the ask a question module um, over the course of the conversation. I'm not gonna go on, I just wanna get right into it. So I like to introduce our moderator for the evening. She is the New York Times bestselling author of the Bells series and the co-author of the Tiny Pretty Things series and the Rumor Game. She's also the COO of the nonprofit called We Need Diverse Books. Let's give a warm welcome to Danielle Clayton. There she, there she is. Hi, Danielle. Hi. Thank you for being here. Mm -hmm. And now, please join me in welcoming tonight's featured author. He is a New England-born Yale University, NYU Tisch School of the Arts, Columbia Law School, and Institut d'Etudes Politiques graduate, as well as the winner of the Ilub Nomo Award for Best Speculative Fiction Novel by an African, and has appeared in Locus Magazine's recommended reading list. He's the author of Beasts Made of Night, uh, its sequel, Crown of Thunder, Riot Baby, War Girls, and now its sequel, Rebel Girls. Everyone? Tochi Onyabuchi. If we were together, I would be screaming. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tochi, and thanks for being here as well. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And we're going to jump right into it. Um, do it to you know, it. you should have never asked me to do this. <laughs> hey. It's going to be a whole bunch of foolishness. So, first oh, yeah. of all, First of all, it's good to see you, my friends. Oh, one. likewise, likewise. Okay. You're you're glowing. You're Look, glowing. The, the, hair. Lighting, the lighting on for you. Get my real African excellence going on. Like, did you hear your bio? Like, I have to do what I can do to make sure that I represent the continent as well as I can. No, um, absolutely, absolutely. And you and this fabulous duology um, that I so love. So. Let's get right into it so I can start roasting you, okay? <laughs> um, I think this is my blood right. Like, I fully pulled my DNA tonight so that you would know that I'm 23% Nigerian. Uh, so that any of the shenanigans that happen tonight, we will just put that in that bucket and we'll leave the 22% Malians out of it. Um, and the Cameroonians at 18%. But it's gonna be a full roast tonight. First of all, for those who have come to listen, we got War Girls. And now we've got Rebel Girls. Can you talk to me about what readers can expect? Give us like a quick, no spoilers. Where are we when we enter for the sequel from War Girls? So Rebel Sisters starts uh, five years after the events in War Girls. And Ify, Which was a surprise yes. when I started it. I was like, Ooh, <laughs> five, five years, years later. So, so Ify is, you know, she's uh, in a way sort of fulfilled her dream of making it to the space colonies. She is a very uh, successful and accomplished uh, medical professional there. She's on the verge of, uh, you know, being a director of her own ward and almost right at the book's outset, you know, she's, she's, in charge in many ways of the refugee population there and providing medical attention to them. And at a certain point, a disease uh, sweeps through the ward, you know, a viral, a viral infection, and she ends up having to trace its source back to Nigeria. And meanwhile, there is another character named Uzo, who is back in Nigeria, in post-war Nigeria, post-war of a sort, um, who is very much sort of caught up in the, the idea of whether or not the memory of the war should be preserved. And what I love is that the character has changed, our beloved has changed. But first, I want you to really, first of all, you've given her the most African excellence of, of like five years. She's doing a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, right. I, I mean, it's, you know, I had, I, 
I had to. She's not, it wouldn't be, she wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be, you know, true to writing a Nigerian character. It'd be very lacking in verisimilitude. If I wrote a Nigerian character who at the age of 19 was not already the assistant director of a ward at a hospital, okay? Right. Verisimilitude. I had to be, you know, I had to be believable. It had to be believable. When I started this, I was like, of course he did. She's going to be a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer. <laughs> an all engineer. In all yeah. in one because of you. And, okay, so first of all, <laughs> talk to me about how you came to make to this five years. Like, a lot has happened. The character has changed. And we are now in a sequel. And this isn't the same person we knew you know, and the same world. So give us a sense of sort of how you extrapolated further into the future, what sort of things you thought about as you were creating, recreating, because we are deep into a post, post world, post war world. Give me the secret sauce of how you did this. Certainly. I mean, so Rebel Sisters is very much concerned with questions of what do you do after the war has ended? Mm -hmm. And it, it's very much inspired by, um, you know, my mom's journey. She was a child during the Biafran War. Um, and I was very much interested in the issue of, you know, how do you move on from that? Because it's, you know, it's arguably the most traumatic thing that can happen to a person's life is living through a yeah. civil war, particularly as a child. But you don't, you know, you don't stop the business of living. Like, how do you how do you move forward? How do you deal with that trauma? Do you deal with that trauma? And on top of that, I wanted to look at issues of assimilation and things that, you know, issues that refugee populations, you know, experience when they flee, whether it's a whether it's a war zone, whether it's religious persecution or or gender-based persecution or what have you, you know, the issues of of racism and discrimination that they will find waiting for them in host countries. You know, my uh, my my mom tells this story. She when she first came to this country for college, she went to Liberty University, Lynchburg, Virginia. Mm -hmm. This oh, is no. I yeah, know exactly yep. where that is. Yep, and like Liberty University in the eighties. So like, <laughs> and in a town called Lynchburg, which my parents, when we drove through it, she would they'd be like, "Hold your breath." <laughs> We're going exactly, to Lynchburg, Virginia. Exactly. And so like, you know, she's this, she's this immigrant woman, this African woman with an accent going to this like, blind, yeah, and like Hold blindingly up. white school that's, you know, hardcore conservative Christian. Mm -hmm. And the stories that she would tell of her time there were always fascinating to me in part because, you know, of course she encountered the racism, but for her, especially coming in as an African immigrant versus an African American for her, in many ways, that racism or those displays of racism were sort of quirks or they were like moments where white people would like be a little bit demented. Like, for instance, they they had, they had chapel. <laughs> I mean, we're going there. We're going there. Uh, we had they, they had chapel as part of their school curriculum. And mom at the time boarded with an Ethiopian woman and the Ethiop her Ethiopian roommate was always late for chapel and asking mom, hey, could you like save me a seat? And so mom would get to chapel. And if there was a group of, of white classmates sitting in a pew, mom would sit down next to them and they would leave and go to another pew. And so mom, rather than be like, oh, like these, these, you know, these white people, they think less of me or whatever, she was like, don't worry, I'll say I, I got you a seat. Like I got you your seat. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So it was like, and so it was interesting, like hearing stories like that and seeing things like that, where, you know, also too, you know, conversely, as as sort of garlanded as Ify becomes in this in this new situation, as much as she succeeds, she's still encountering racism. And you know, some some of it is from the benevolent, you know, white folk who think they're doing good or who are well-meaning. Some of it is more malicious. Some of it is in her personal life. A lot of it is in her professional life. And that was something that I wanted to deal with, like in the context of, you know, what happens after after the war. Right, and I wanna know sort of when you were, and this encapsulates also war girls, 
when you were deciding to extrapolate in, you know what I mean, and to think about science fiction, science fiction and fantasy spaces and talking about war and talking about Nigerian identity and African identity and sort of refugees, why, like, why that? You could have gone in a lot of different directions. Was this because it's something that your mom dealt with and you wanted to explore sort of the things that made your mom her? Why this piece of Nigerian history? There's so much history, ancient culture, right? Why did you like zone in on this? And what do you think are the ripples that we can learn from your futuristic version to look back at the real thing and the real victims and the real scars left behind in actual Nigeria? Certainly. I mean, it's, you know, in, in certain ways, this was a very sort of selfish endeavor for me. This was a sort of roundabout way for me to get closer to my mom um, and find out more about her life and her background. It's like now I had an excuse to ask her all these really probing questions. Yeah, about, like, yeah like, because like, you know, this, this isn't like an easy thing to talk mm -hmm. about you know, on a personal level. And so if I could sort of mask it as, as research, you know, research for a book or what have you, um, and by this point I've written and published a couple books. So mom knows that this is, that this is real. Like, it's not me just like, you know, messing no around, around with my little hobby on the side while I'm little supposed hobby. to be being a lawyer, lawyer. you know, all that. I was about to say, you know, last <laughs> you cooking that Nigerian lady when you know you should be practicing law. Right. I mean, I, I did get admitted to the bar, so she's, so she's happy. <laughs> But it was it was a way for me to to get closer to her. But also, too, I wanted to write a very specifically Nigerian story um, and also too a very specifically African story. I think this is one of the things you know, there's there's talk now of the the distinction between Afrofuturism and African futurism. Right. We're going to get so, into it tonight. I got a question. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Lobbing it. Just go oh, ahead. Yeah, no, I, you know, I got the layup and you, absolutely. The okay. alley -oop, we got it. Got um, it. But yeah, so, so Afrofuturism is very much like an American invention um, and is in many ways geared towards repairing the sort of primordial rending that happened during the uh, triangle slave trade. Cause like one of the, one of the, one of the aspects of American chattel slavery was that it becomes a lot easier to, treat people as property to buy and sell and separate families and all that stuff. If you can completely obliterate their history and right. sense of history so that you like these people don't even have their names. They're literally just line items on a bill of laden and you completely obliterate any and all connection they have with what came before them. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you keep doing that over and over and over again to the point where like, it becomes impossible to trace family trees because everybody's been scattered to the winds. There are no tribal lines. There is no language. There is no exactly. connection to Africa. 400 Ex years. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Oh, wow. For hundreds of years, right? Yeah. And so, you know, Afrofuturism is a way of, you know, in this, in a sort of imaginative space, repairing that injury. Yeah. Um, and so you get things like, you get things like Black Panther, you get artifacts mm -hmm. like Janelle Monet's music, you get, you know, that sort of thing. And the thing with Afrofuturism is that in many ways, it imagines a sort of, sort of, African Shangri-La. So like things yeah. will be blended together. So take Black Panther, the movie, for example, right? You have T'Challa's accent is South African. Right. Mbaku is talking like a Nigerian. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Wakabi is, uh, I think that's like a Ugandan accent. You know, mm -hmm. everybody's accents are all over the place, right? You have this, you have this fusion of all these different African, you know, um, cosmologies and, and, cultural rituals and what have you. The chains of Africa, like yeah. just like it's a fusion. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. It's it's. We it's have the fusion. Nigerian dish. We have the Malian dish. The Ugandan exactly. dish. Exactly. We're all eating together. Exactly. Whereas, right. like. African futurism is more right. grounded in specific, um, 
specific realities are arising from specific realities or specific cultural traditions or specific like political situations. Because you look at, say, for instance, a lot of African writers throughout history and across genres, whether it's literary fiction, speculative fiction, the whole project of like African literature has been convincing the rest of the world that Africa is not a country, right? right. Like, and so you have those two. But it is those one place. Exa exactly. So, <laughs> so that's part of why I wanted to write about the Biafran War, or at least write a story that was based on this very specific moment in Nigerian history, was that I didn't necessarily want to write um, a, you know, an Afrofuturist story. I wanted to write a very specifically African and specifically Nigerian story. Um, and also too, like the, you know, the Biafran war, we, we're not really supposed to talk about it. I was about uh, to say, this is not something I remember hearing about it, but it yeah. was something that my Nigerian or even my West African friends in general who had been touched by it, wanted to have a conversation about it. The aunties are like, no, we don't talk about, we don't yeah. talk about that. So. Exactly. And, and, you know, there there are political reasons for it, but also, you know, personal reasons for it, too. I think, you know, when when you look at, you know, particularly a lot of sort of hyphenate Americans whose parents or grandparents lived through, you know, these these national catastrophes or what have you, there's that almost generational silence. Right. And yeah. whether it's like, you know, the trauma that those people endured is just too great for them to like verbalize or process through, you know, verbalization or memorialization. You know, and it sometimes takes a generation before the next wave can like write about or excavate right. that past or it's political like, OK, the government, you know, came out a certain way and they don't want to reopen certain wounds or whatever. So we're not going to teach this in schools. We're not going to talk about it. We're very much going to discourage any sort of reparations or truth and reconciliation scheme. Just don't talk about it. And so I'm when I write, I'm very much. I'm a little bit driven by transgressive impulses. Um, I like being able to do things that I'm not really supposed to be able to do. Trouble. <laughs> okay. You always say that I'm the troublemaker. You're such a troublemaker. No, this is why we're friends, though. This I know. This is why it's we're friends, true. though. It's like I turn you up, you turn me up, and we just go back and forth, back and forth, back and exactly. forth. Exactly. If you our text messages, you'd be like, yo, <laughs> you're bugging. Like, it's just a back and forth. Yeah. Just yeah. Ridiculousness. And what I love is that, yes, this story feels uniquely and distinctively Nigerian. And I don't think I've read a fantasy that has that texture um, to where I feel transported in the cultural norms. And of course, I'm an amalgamated African. I have no idea the actual cultural touch points um, I because that was taken from me. So I can identify certain things. Mm -hmm. um, but what I love is what you're restoring. And we're going to talk about Afrofuturism versus African futurism, because the way that you present it makes me feel good about it. And the way that sometimes it's talked about makes me feel terrible about it. And I'll tell you that in a second. What I love is that I'm learning from reading your work. I'm like finding my way back home in it because you've left behind all of these Easter eggs for Nigerian readers, but also you're calling us who have not had it to learn more. And I love that, right? It opens it up because we are also taught here when you grow up here, as you know, to hate all things Africa. The image of Africa in my mind are the National Geographic magazines that my grandmother ordered for me to read. That's mm -hmm. what filled me in as a child. And that made me, and the way that we're taught in school, made me think, oh, Africa, that's one big place of people mm -hmm. in the village. And yeah. I don't want to yeah. go there, right? Because the village for me, and I kept thinking about when you talk about your mother and not wanting to talk about this. And I think about my grandmother not wanting to talk about the trauma of Jim Crow. And it taking, yep. pulling it out of her in little pieces because it's something you don't talk about because it was so terrifying. Um, but the way that you frame African futurism, I wish was written about and talked about so that it doesn't feel like it's weaponized. There should be a space for African creators to honor the specificity of your experience the way you did in your duology versus sometimes it feels like a, a place that black American writers who are not who are amalgamated africans from chattel slavery don't get to have access to versus a learning experience that we mm -hmm. so desperately need to be called home 
if that makes sense. Yeah, it's like it's like when Lemonade came out. Yes. And we all watched that and like and everybody was afterwards researching all this stuff about like Yoruba culture and cosmologies and all the little Easter eggs that Beyonce had sprinkled throughout that visual mm -hmm. album. Like that I think is such an incredible an instructive artifact in many, many, many ways. And like, it's because it's not this, and I think part of it too is, you know, boils down to the fact that it's black people doing it. Like right. if it was a white person that was collapsing all these different sort of aspects of Africa and African, you know, cultures and whatnot into this singular artifact, we'd be like, um, don't do that. <laughs> um, that's, you know, you're flattening us versus, you know, if, I feel like if it's another black person, particularly a black American, you know, you get at some of that repairing that we were talking about earlier. Like there's mm -hmm. this, there's this like, you know, we're on, you know, opposite ends of a bridge and we're meeting at the middle and we're seeing each other's faces. Like it's that's just a call and response, exactly. right? Like I'm calling out to you and you're responding to me and you're telling me the specific things to keep researching. And I always, honestly, I do feel shit upon most of the time where I'm like, Yes, my bloodline is fractured as hell. But however, if I were to make a piece of art, it would be fractured because that is the nature of what has happened to us. Mm -hmm. So Beyonce's art being a fracture of the real sort of the thing, I wish pe more people were, would see it as such versus it's like, it's not, we're trying not to make it an affront. It's literally, this is the bloodline. This is yeah. the actual bloodline. And please let us grow, teach us welcome us home, <laughs> respond to us so that we can come home. And I feel like works like yours, you do that in the way that you present things. You don't, you're not catering to a white gaze. You're very much inviting black readers in. And I don't know if you, how, when you create, you sit down, do you think about that? Will you think about the readers? Are you thinking about people at home, people here, and all of those intersections? Like, talk to me about what comes through you when you're when you're processing all of this stuff because it feels seamless i mean i i write for me okay. like i i'm my ideal reader and that this is with everything that i write whether it's ya adult my essays all of that i'm writing the stuff that I want to read, you know, like if I were to walk into a Barnes and Noble or an Uncle Bobby's uh, or, you know, a, a library, I would want to be able to pick War Girls or Rebel Sisters off the shelf and read like that would and that would be my jam. Right. And so that's what I and one of the things that I've discovered, too, and I don't know like how this works mechanically. I don't know what the psychological like mechanism is for this, but I found in my experience that the more I write for myself, the more it seems I'm writing for others or the more that others like, you know, can relate to the experiences that I'm relating. Like I, you know, War Girls is my love letter to Gundam Wing and there are Gundam Wing heads like all over the place that are like, yo, he really did that, you know? And so there's like that aspect of it too. And so I just, I, I write what's interesting to me. And I think by nature of being a human being, like what's interesting to me is also interesting to others. Yes, but I also think that Nigerians have a long history of literature and story. And for me, in terms of what has been exported from Nigeria to me as a black American reader, Nigerian stories dominate. If oh, I know yeah. anything because of the excellence, <laughs> if I know anything about the continent, Nigeria is the loudest for me in terms of what is transmitted, right? You guys fight about your jaw love, like you just- We're, we're the loudest objectively, yeah. No, yeah. I'm not, If yeah. I'm gonna run into an African uh, doctor, most likely it's gonna be a Nigerian person, right? Like I, I, I didn't like, make the rules. I didn't make the rules. You guys are the loudest or tend to be the loudest. So you become, you come from a long tradition of the pen being a, a place for, you know what I mean, for exploration and for story. And so your stories sit on top of others and add to this beautiful canon. And what I love about your renditions of Nigeria and your integration of Nigerian cultures, norms, all of those things is that I actually feel a texture of Tochi is scratching at something 
that is not what white folks actually are looking for or asking for or trying to create a minstrel show. Sometimes I find that black stories, African stories, create a minstrel for white mainstream to have to feel good or feel like they know something about Africa and I don't feel like you're doing that in your work. Like we all come away from this duology and come away from your first duology and you're in right baby with things to think about. It's a rattle in the bones. It's a very different experience. Um, yeah, no, like I, I don't, you know, to, to put it as, you know, as bluntly as possible, like I don't write for white people. Yeah. Um, you know, white people buy my books. Like, <laughs> like yeah. you, know, you are not barred from reading and appreciate and, and you know, appreciating and, and loving, loving these books. But I, it's like, it's like with the diversity 101 panels and conversations mm -hmm. that like are, you know, have, have, have been the sort of, have been in the water with regards to the, you know, YA community for so long. It's like, we're past that. Like we're, we're like, if I have to answer another question about why it's extraordinary to have a dope black girl on the cover of my book, it's like, right. what, what have we been doing this for? Right. I want to have a more elevated conversation. Yeah. And so just by assuming certain um, understandings, like assuming that, you know, like another, like a perfect example of this is with Riot Baby. There's the Harlem section. There's somebody who drives by who's blasting Dipset Anthem from their car, right? And if you are in Harlem- I am in Harlem right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you heard Dipset Anthem, like you, like you knew exactly okay. when that yeah. was right yeah, like you knew yeah. um you know with you know and even with the south central chapter like i can mention that somebody's watching a uh, you know a tv broadcast and the name rodney king is mentioned people will know exactly what i'm talking about they'll know that i'm talking about literally the day when it was announced that those officers were were going to go free and similarly with with war girls and with rebel sisters it's, I think, it's interesting because we talk about world building, right? And yeah. particularly in a science fiction and fantasy mm -hmm. context. And, you know, people will talk about the difficulties with regards to, okay, what aspect of technology do I explain? Or what do I just assume for the reader? For me, it's often that the, the, the place where the most questions arise with regards to what to explain and what not to explain is simply with another culture that already exists. Oh, right. like what aspect of Nigerian cosmology do I need to explain here? Or can I just like assume that the reader will know or just like, you know, let let the reader figure out as they go. For instance, if I name giant robots after after, you know, aspects of the Igbo pantheon, mm -hmm. do I have to explain that? And in a way that I wouldn't if I named them after items in the Greek pantheon, right? Exactly. Like Zeus and, and them. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's that sort of thing. And I think, you know, I want to write in a way that that assumes an intelligence of the reader and a curiosity of the reader as well. And like and I don't want to like my readers aren't stupid. Like that's that's what a lot of it boils down to is my readers just aren't stupid. They get it. Um and I I want to write for the ones that really, really, really get it. And so it's not even just that there are Easter eggs with black culture, but like anime Easter eggs, like throughout Beast Made of Night and Crown of Thunder, there are Full Metal Alchemist Easter eggs all over the place, right? And it's like that sort of, that sort of thing. Also, I think that you're doing dignity to the source material and to, and to Nigeria and to the mother country, because I think that there have been so many depictions that you're fighting against that are built into our imagination in the West of mm -hmm. Africa as village, Africa as primitive, Africa as this and that, and your stories are counter narratives to that. And Absolutely. I said, yeah, I finally felt like I was like, oh, this is my shit. Because yeah. no, there is no, there's a village, but it ain't no village like in the National Geographic. I feel this sense of pride. I feel because Unfortunately, because there are so few books that feature black characters, let alone Nigerian, let alone African characters in sci-fi fantasy. I feel this tremendous responsibility and also like pressure and also fear that we're adding to certain narratives and that the children who look like us who are reading these books are still running from National Geographic. 
And yeah, yeah. don't do that. Yeah, well, uh, also too, I wanted to, I made a conscious effort to not write about colonialism, whether yeah. like the reality or the allegory, not because those, you know, the issues that came out of colonialism don't deserve to be talked about or written about or dramatized or anything. Just that I didn't want to have to deal with white people. Like yeah. I didn't want, I didn't want white characters in these stories, you know, I didn't want them as antagonists. Mm -hmm. I didn't want them as side characters. I didn't want them as like, you know, I, I, I wanted it, it all black everything, right? Like that's that's one of the things that that I wanted to do because those are the stories that are really that are much more interesting to me. And I've read so many stories, so many stories that take place on or involve the the continent that have to do with white people. And like even though it'll be the horrible things that white folks have done, you know, to Africans to the you know the African continent, um it still in a certain way centers whiteness and centers white people. And I just didn't want to, I was tired of that, right? right? Like, it's not even just that there's a moral imperative for me to like not write those stories. I'm just, they're boring to a certain extent. Like I've, I've, I've seen them, I've right. read them, I've, I've listened to them. Like- You're ready for the next part. conversation, right? Like- Exactly. What happens it's, when we are yeah. Like what exactly. happens when we are trying to put ourselves back together again, which is what I love about this duology. It's like, what happens? Like, how do we put ourselves together? How do we deal with PTSD? How do we deal with trauma? How do we deal with going forward in our lives, but behind us is a mess, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that that, and what is the, what are the lies that we tell and, and who tells the stories, right? And you have a lot of great themes. And I want you to talk too about sort of, the themes that you started in War Girls and what you discovered in Rebel Sisters and how they sort of, they stitched together in a very interesting way. Um, and I feel like you were scratching at a lot to leave us with, I was like, damn. Like, like that's what a Tochi book, I'm always like, well, damn. <laughs> <laughs> like every time, and I'm like, cause it leaves me with something to think about. You don't always tie everything up, which I love, but you leave a question where you're like, okay, shoot. This has multiple answers. Let's Mission talk accomplished. Let's talk things <laughs> and how you rock and how you layer in the fat of your books. In absolutely, yeah. No, I go into every book with you know a bunch of things that I want to talk about, yes. and it's not as though I will have come to conclusions before writing the book or even during the course of writing the book. It's literally me. the The writing of the book will oftentimes just be me working my way through questions. So, yeah. you know, the question in War Girls of, in many ways, humanity and consciousness, right? Because you have in a number of different characters, this, this you know, spectrum of human and machine. You know, you have, you know, you have Onyi who's like partially cyberized, but in a way that's very, you know, weaponized. She's an augment, she has mechanical parts, but that's really just to make her a better like warrior, right? right. And you have Enyamaka who is an android, but like who will style herself as a who, as opposed mm -hmm. to a what, right? Right. And like, and your maka grows personality. And then you have, you have Agu, you have like all these different characters that are, are different angles of the question of what does it mean to be human? Like, where yeah. does humanity come from? Like, is there, is it, is it, is it just data? Like, are we, is, is humanity simply the result of there just being enough data that we get this like, you know, eureka moment where consciousness happens? Or is there something more intrinsic? And if there is something more intrinsic, where does it come from, right? Can it be transferred? Like, right, all, like from that initial question, what does it mean to be human? All these other questions start to sort of spider web out. And that's oftentimes where I see the different sort of actual manifestations in the book of those of those questions. And so I was very much interested in, in questions of humanity and also to, you know, questions of choice. But I also wanted to talk about, I wanted to talk about terrorism and choice and dogma and, and, you know, being so driven by a belief that you let it govern your entire life. And it could be a political belief, like, oh, this entire race of people is inferior and they use child soldiers or whatever. Or it could be a personal belief, like 
these people killed my sister. They killed the person I love the most in the world. I'm going to make it my life's goal to massacre as many of them as possible, right? So what does it mean to be so consumed by a single belief that it lit it literally consumes you? So that's stuff that I wanted to that I wanted to play around with. And in War Girls, things are very sort of manichaean. It's always, you know, all one way or all the other. And mm -hmm. very like a lot of the book is playing around with that. Like, okay, you thought it was one way, but it's really the other way. What does that do to you? Right. And then in Rebel Sisters, I wanted to like scramble those pieces even more yeah. because then you, you know, what happens when you start to implicate memory, mm -hmm. right? And and trauma, right? So the different ways in which people deal with trauma, like there's you know, there's, you know, people will act out various behaviors as a, you know, coping mechanism to trauma that will oftentimes be them sort of reenacting the traumatic like event or dynamic over and over and over again. And they won't even necessarily know that they're doing it. Other people will just like completely suppress the memory um, yeah. of the traumatic event such that they, they even forget that it happened. Other people, it's like a daily struggle to keep from letting that traumatic event define you. Um, and they're like, there are all these different ways in which people cope. And one of the things that I wanted to get at is, is this idea that there's a single way to move forward from trauma or to cope with trauma or to live with trauma. I feel like... I feel like the current sort of day and age, particularly with social media, when everybody's giving out unsolicited advice, you know, yeah. people are always telling other people how to cope with trauma yeah. or like what they should be doing with their trauma or like, oh, yeah, it was like, oh, my God. Yeah, and care. Yeah, and they'll like they'll like be subtweeting you by being like, yeah, my therapist told me yesterday, da 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 da. Oh, um, I know way too much about what people's therapists are telling them right. because of Twitter. Like y'all, you know, y'all can keep it anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, but like you know, that conversation's for y'all. That might not be for me, right? right. Um, but I wanted to really live in other people's realities that way. I wanted to see, like, you know, what if you, you know, what happens when you try to force a a coping mechanism onto an like. If somebody is intent on, on sort of not ruminating on a traumatic event, and that's the way that they're able to go through their life, but then you barge in are like, and are like, it's imperative that you remember that this thing happened to you, and it's imperative that you remember it vividly, and that's the only way we can move forward, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, that's violence. Yes. That's absolutely. violence that you're inflicting on another person. So like there's that dimension, but also too, that's very narratively dynamic for me. And there's a lot of drama there that I like to explore. And for me as a writer, I want to jump into the most dramatic situation possible. And what I love too, is that you give black characters a diversity within the blackness itself with which to explore said topics. Because unfortunately we, think in archetypes, right? And oftentimes the black person who fits into certain archetypes gets one role and creating this landscape of lots of different ways to process and lots of different black characters, you're giving us lots of, you're giving people lots of different anchors. Like, oh, I'm like this character. I'm more like this one. And that's something that I think we don't get. We don't yeah. get worlds. Yeah, no, I've, I mean, you and you saw it with the election, right? Like, there oh, was, God, yes. there was all this talk. I, you know, I couldn't not talk about. I know, know, I know, uh, I know. But like, there was all this talk about like the Latino vote, like, yeah. like all of a sudden, like, like Cubans and Guatemalan immigrants, and you know, and Puerto Ricans, and you know, the, 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 like everybody's all of a sudden the Latino vote, right? And right. people. You know, people were so shocked that like third generation Cubans were voting differently than like, you know, Mexican immigrants. And it's like, yo, fam, like you, these are all different. <laughs> these are all different people, right? But like in America messy. It's like because there are yes. black people and then there are Latino people and, bec and there are Asian people and we're all supposed to be the same. I say this as a writer all the time. I think I just realized in this election that. Latino people can be white people too, that in that are white people. And I was like, wait a second. Oh, oh shit. 
And I think that because I'm like, wait a second, but y'all are supposed to be in Brown Town with us. And you mean that there are, this feels like a betrayal. And so- Yeah, yeah like there are white, there are like whole conversations of race happening like within the Latino community. Like there are white Latinos, they're like, they're black Latino. Like it's, there's a whole- <laughs> with us, you know what I mean? Or when they put that crazy lady, excuse me for using that term, but she she is wild. That wild ass African lady, I don't know if she's Nigerian, I don't know what country she is. The medical doctor who was talking about if you just, remember they put her out there during the quarantine? That lady talking about if you just do X, Y, and Z on Trump's medical team. You don't oh, remember wow. her? oh, wait, was that Deborah Burks? No, it's a black lady that they Ooh. pulled out. In, from, the, from the sunken place, from the sunken place. An African lady from, she was a demon doctor, talking about the demons inside you, and that's what Corona, and you just had to call them out. This was an African lady, and I was like, don't do this to the diaspora, please, please. Dang. Take her off, get the Sandman out here what? from the hollow, come and get her. Like, this is taking us all down. Which yeah, and, but like, but like, so you see, so you see even there the destructive ways in which assuming that, uh, that, that, you know, non-white communities exist as monoliths is so detrimental to everybody, right? It's detrimental right. to everybody. And it's like, you walk into a bookstore, you walk into a library, you look on the shelves, there are a million ways to be white. Yeah. A million, yeah. right? Like people will know that the white people in William Faulkner novels are different from the white people in David Foster Wallace novels are yep. different from the white people in Jane Austen novels are, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. There needs to be at least, at least that same sort of diversity of depiction for every single, every single marginalized community. And I'm not just talking about race, I'm talking about religion, because like also too, you look at, for instance, the, the Muslim community, there are like over a billion Muslims mm -hmm. in the world, like a billion. And like, you look at that sort of geographic spread and everything, just the sheer diversity of experiences there. And so like, I, no, no, non-white like non credity is a monolith and that i think is is the that i think is the is the assumption that i just go into things with because like for so long i think people i think we've assumed you know exactly that like you know say for instance the you know latino community is a monolith or that the you know asian community is a monolith of course not even disaggregating east asian from south asian right exactly. and then furthermore like not even disaggregating like koreans from japanese from chinese and like etc right. etc cetera, etc cetera, et cetera, right it it does us especially us as storytellers yep. such a disservice to assume this this uniformity of experience of an entire community i think I think there's a moral imperative to not do that. I also think like, you know, that makes stories more interesting and interesting stories are what I want to read. Yes, and I wonder too, before I start taking questions from the audience, I wonder if you feel pressure as a Nigerian author, as a black author, um, as, you know what I mean, first generation, if you feel a pressure to write certain characters and to write Nigerian people or people of Nigerian descent, also black people, black American people, all of those intersections with which you sit at in a particular way, do you feel a pressure mm. in that? Because you were talking about how we don't get to be all mm -hmm. of those things. When we think of a Nigerian character, we think of one thing. Do yeah. You feel a pressure. Um, no, I mean maybe at maybe at a certain point very early on in my career I might have felt it, but like I I remember there was a point after you know after Riot Baby came out and people were you know talking like the you know, the reviews came out and people seemed to really 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 like it, um, particularly white people, which surprised me because it's not the most like flat flattering, right? Like them in that you flame them, you yeah, really like. You know, I had to let that thing off, right? And mm -hmm. also, too, I was writing black characters who aren't, you know, ultimately concerned with justice. Like, yeah. it's literally, I don't want justice, I want revenge. Yeah. And that feels like such a dangerous thing to say, right? But I got away with saying it. And so, like, that happened, and I was like, oh, all bets are off. You like, like I, oh. 
I can be whatever. Yeah, no, you literally you you can't you can't tell me nothing. No, no, it's <laughs> it's a rap. It is a Reynolds rap. So I I know that that was very much um, a flashpoint for me, but also too, the you know if if people sort of come to my stories assuming that I'm that I'm writing to a sort of monolithic depiction or what whatnot, like that's on them. Like it's not my job to to fix the preconceived notions that they come into my books with, right? Like mm -hmm. that's that's on them. So I think there was a certain point where I was like, look, I can't assume all of the reader's responsibility here. Like there was a certain point in my writing career where I hit that epiphany, I hit that realization. And I think that sort of, that combined with the idea that I didn't have to write for other people. Okay. I just, I like, and it's like, you know, I, I don't feel as though I need to write, you know, it's it's not as though there's some sense of obligation or responsibility hovering over me like, okay, I need to portray black people in this certain light. It's like, no, I need to write the most interesting story that mm -hmm. I can write. And like, of course, like, I think part of it too, and this sort of dovetails into the whole like, you know, idiotic cancel culture conversation. Like the idea is that you need to be able as a writer, as a storyteller to defend every single narrative choice that you make. If you can't defend, if you don't feel comfortable defending that choice in front of an audience, maybe don't make that choice, maybe right? Like, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so like there in, in that sense, there is, you know, a sort of responsibility where for instance, if I'm writing, if I'm writing a queer relationship, you know, I don't want to particularly as, you know, heterosexual cisgender dude right i don't want to harm already marginalized communities i don't want to you know sort of kick them while they're down i like even even sort of um by accident like i don't right. i'm i'm not trying to do that so how can i be responsible to that community right or how can i right. be responsible to those communities so there is in in a sense that type of responsibility, but it's different because the power dynamics have shifted. It's my responsibility to marginalize communities, to other marginalized communities versus whatever, you know, vestigial sense of responsibility I may have to a majority readership. Right. I just feel like Nigerians are very vocal. Yeah, we don't like you. As a culture, and you they will let you know, okay, if your jollof is raggedy, if your book is raggedy, if you've said something raggedy on the timeline, the whole con the whole country, Lagos is alive and well on the timeline. Nigerian Twitter. Oh, absolutely. Like, and the thing is, we're doing it for your own benefit. <laughs> That's what you say. That's what you say. They light we're, you up, yo. We're doing it for your own benefit. If you're dressed raggedy, why would we let you leave the house dressed raggedy? Right. Right. That's why, whenever you're about to step into it with a Nigerian, the thing that they will tell you is. My friend, respect yourself. <laughs> right? They won't insult you. They won't, you know, they won't drag you for filth immediately. They'll tell you to respect yourself. I that's, mean, I love it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. just that's how we do. I said, you know, I, I posted some things about the current conflicts that were happening in um in the country. And I got a lot of DMs from Nigerian readers and they were like, thank you. Um, I heard you say that you were 23% Nigerian. I'm glad to see that you said something about your bloodline and that means you're 100% Nigerian. <laughs> uh -huh. No, you know, you know, you wanna know something hilarious. So after, after you know, Biden and Harris were, were elected, um, you know, all the foreign leaders were sending in their congratulations and everything like that. And the New York Times collected a bunch of their statements and sentiments. And the former president of Nigeria, um, Olusegun uh, Obasanjo, he wrote that, you know, he had particular congratulations for um, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, who he is absolutely certain has Nigerian DNA. And I was like, we claim her! Look, <laughs> is something that I love about they the community. No time. As soon as she was like, yes, uh-huh, one of us, my sister. Right. My sister. Exactly. It's immediate. It's immediate. Like, oh, I can tell. I can yep. tell. I can yeah, tell. I, I see it in the excellence, the way the excellence, excellence just surrounds you. It's very Nigerian. It's very, very Nigerian. Yeah. And it's it's hysterical. And it's something I love. And they will read you for filth, but also be like, come, eat the jollof. It is exactly. the best. We it is it. the best. <laughs> it's great. And so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. I have pestered you tonight. Oh, this is a good one. 
If you could change one American thing to be wholly Nigerian, what would it be? <laughs> I gotta do it. It's so good. It's such a good question. <laughs> wholly Nigerian. Wholly, truly. Wow. Oh my wow. What that is a that is a fantastic. I mean, I would probably change the national anthem. Star Spangled mm -hmm. Banner does not slap. It does not slap at all. It does, it does not, slap. not. We need some Afrobeat. Exactly. Exactly. Some doggy go like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, would, I would I would change that. You would change it. Okay. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> um okay. Any nods to anime in Rebel Sisters? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. There's you know, a this is not my bag, so I don't even know. <laughs> um yeah, no, I one of my favorite anime series of all time is Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. And that's probably one of my one of my favorite sort of facets of the whole Ghost in the Shell universe. And I was very much I was very much fascinated by the Tachikomas and the idea of of sentience there and the way in which sentience what is that? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I think it's where to watch anime. Where do you then, even watch it? Or who I, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna connect offline. Don't worry, I got okay, you. I, got I need you. Like a whole list. I need to know. Okay. I got you. Okay. Uh, but yeah, they're these they're these cute little like crab tanks or whatever that are like weapons, but they develop they they have artificial intelligence and they start to just like you know develop personalities like bit by bit over the course of the over the course of the series and. So there are there are a few nods there. Um, there's one in particular. Well, there. So there's one. I'm gonna go back to War Girls. There's one, and and nobody has has contacted me contacted me about this one yet. <laughs> there, there is a nod to Outlaw Star in no, uh, even one know. chapter in War Girls. My Outlaw Star heads, they know what I'm talking. Yep, yep. They know they they know the vibes. They know the vibes. I need a whole tutorial. My niece, who's 14, is so into anime. So mm -hmm. much so that if I told her that if she, depending on coronavirus, if she had all her grades right for her first year of high school, because it's been really rough doing online, um, and she's at my alma mater, that I would take her to Japan for two weeks over the <sighs> summer so she can get her anime fix and all of that. So I need to get myself ready. Because Yo, I, yeah, I yeah, you do. It. Yeah, I do. Yeah, you do. Um, Okay, so also Zoraida wants you to drop your metal playlist, so you need to do that. <laughs> yes. No. Speaking of which, speaking of which, Zoraida, we got to talk about first of all, we got a new Deftones album. Also, twentieth anniversary edition of White Pony is coming out with the Black Stallion remixes. What? And new Seven Dust. Get like, yo, they. It's like it's like they knew that we were struggling in twenty twenty. They knew. And they just, and yeah, now I, and we got new system of a down and we got new system of a down. Like, like what even, what I even? I can't take it. Like, let's hey. just stay with the Afrobeat. Let's stay with the Afrobeat. Let's stay with black American music and black music globally. Afrobeat is, African music is the best music in the world. Also, also some, music, of the most, some, of the music. Most, some of the most talented people in metal are black. Send them to me. However, <laughs> I want beats that I can rock to. Okay, look. We had we had Nigerians at a wedding dancing to System of a Down earlier this year. But I want to be at a wedding with Nigerians dancing to Nigerian music. <laughs> we contain <laughs> multitudes, Danielle. We contain multitudes. Look, I'm trying to get busy. Okay, like you can't do nothing with the hips to the metal music, and I. <laughs> You say that now. You say that now, but you know, where, where there where there is no way, the Lord makes a way. Look, okay. I just think people of African descent really like to shake the hips, act the areas. Okay, and I never felt like metal music gave me enough to get it going. Right, like, but we'll talk about this because I just about. my ears. I feel like an auntie. I'm like I can't handle it. Um, it's so funny because today a Jehovah's Witness left me a letter, sent me a whole letter in the mail talking about the music that I listen to because I guess they live in the building and I guess <laughs> like, 
my rap music, my Afrobeat, my, you know what I mean? My salsa music, like they're over it and they want me to come back to the Lord. And they gave me a card and wrote me a handwritten letter. It was a whole thing. And I was like, mm, I'm gonna turn it up. I'm gonna play some real satanic, satanic shit now. So oh, I you, gotta, you gotta hit him with that wop. You gotta hit him with that wop. Exactly. You gotta, you gotta hit him with that wop. Oh, there'll be, it'll be so many letters. Oh yeah. Um. Oh my gosh. Okay, so this is a great question. Your work is very authentic and culturally relevant. How would you feel if your work was significantly altered in movie form? Bet this is a good question. Mm, mm. For white people in war, girl. We gonna be in. We gonna be in England, honey. That's what we gonna be. It's gonna be War of the Roses. Oh my goodness! Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, part of it would part of it would depend, right? So, you know, with the issue of adaptation, and Danielle, you can most definitely speak to this now, uh, given that the trailer has just dropped for the Netflix series adaptation of Tidy Pretty Things. Congratulations! Yes. Congratulations! Um, but yeah, like as you know, it, you know, it it can vary project to project the involvement that the writer of the source material will have. So, it could be the type of thing where you know, the writer writes the book, the rights get sold or they get picked up by whoever. And then like, that's it. The writer has no more input. Or it could be a situation where the writer, if it ends up being adapted to a TV series, is like an executive producer on it, has like very large amounts of creative control, you know, is writing episodes for the, you know, so, and there's everything in between. That feels like the so, dream, the one that you just laid out. That's right? Yeah. I mean, and you know, with regards to that, I, I, all I can say is big things guan. So yes, with yeah. regards to you know, with regards to adaptations and my work and and all that jazz. So like, I, I think part of it would depend on you know the contours of the deal, and I wouldn't feel comfortable, you know relinquishing the amount of control that I would need to relinquish for them to like throw white people in a story that where there is no white people. Unless the bag was big enough. <laughs> you would let them be dirty like that? You would let the like, ghost in the shell you? That you would let them go in the shell you? Yo, if if I were able, if I were able to pay off these student loans and yeah. set mom up for life, right. both of them, yeah, right. Scar Joe can Scar Joe can do whatever. I'll write more books. Like that's not going to be a problem. But yeah, if I can get these student loans off my back, I mean that's real. That that is real. Oh, yeah. Sally Bay is a whole mess. Of we would like to get them off. I think what's interesting too to follow up on that question to think about you know the lady who should not be named, uh, mm. our turf lady J.K. She wouldn't let any Americans be cast in the Harry Potter franchise. And I wonder for, you know, content creators like you who have worlds that are distinctly Nigerian or distinctly West African, distinctly of the continent. I wonder, like, when you were bringing up our beloved king, Chadwick, and his, you know, sort of fake acting. <laughs> him a little bit. He, he I, tried. He was doing it. He was really doing it. He, they all him. tried. They yeah. all try, but how do you feel? Like I am excited to create worlds where I can give all black people so many different roles, but there mm -hmm. is a beef between African, um, especially British um, African actors and American, black American actors. And I just wonder where you sort of fit. Cause it is kind of corny to hear a struggle doing co continent accents versus they can always do an English accent and an American accent. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, like I remember, I remember the first time I heard Idris Elba like accept an award, and I found out he was British. I was like, "Wait, Stringer Bell is British? Mm -hmm. What?" And um, sexy too, honey. Hello, yo, Sierra Leone, yeah. honey, fam. <laughs> Beautiful. Just, Beautiful. Ooh. Yes. African um, excellence. Talk about it. Talk about it. I think a lot of it, I think a lot of what you were talking about is the problem of, of unimaginative casting directors and people who are responsible for cast. The, like the people that you want for those roles, the black Americans that you want for those roles are out there and they're dope. Like those actors are out there. And this idea that, oh, like, you know, we couldn't find them. So, you know, these black British actors are just better. Like that's not that's that's like categorically false and don't get me wrong i am so happy that we get to experience daniel kaluuya yes. you know that we get to experience david o o Oyelowo. like we get mm -hmm. to experience 
all these incredible talents, right? Yeah. But if people are saying that the reason we get to experience those is because of a dearth of qualified Black American actors, that is a whole lie. Whole it lie. is a lie. <laughs> it is a lie. I don't want, they're creating an infighting when it's like, no, we're all Black. Let's all Black people come together exactly. and move forward. Right. Exactly. And like, that's like, I think that's, that's one of the, that's one of the things that I'm working towards, you know, yeah. in the sort of grander project of my stories is I want to really sort of blow open this diversity of blackness, right? Like right. I want, I, I want there to be enough roles in my joint that you could throw like, you know, however many black yeah. actors you want at it. And there would like, everybody would be able to eat, right? That's because I feel like, right yeah. Everybody should be able to eat. There's this whole scarcity mentality like, oh, like if if a black British actor gets this role, like, you know, that just kills it for all the black Americans. Like, no, like there is enough for everybody. Also, too, if we're re if 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 Hollywood and other places are really trying to be about that race blind casting or whatever, you need to start casting some you need to start casting some Negroes in your joints. Exactly. Like you need to you need to if you're going to be like like race neutral does not mean white. No, it doesn't. And it tends, tends to be that way. And like when I think about some of the wonderful castings, like when we look at Lovecraft Country and Ruby, she's my favorite character, that beautiful African lady. Oh, like, I was like, oh, ma'am, I can't <laughs> wait to see you every week, honey, as beautiful as you are. And so to be able to be to not have her or not be exposed to her because of politics. Oh, her family is not black American. They didn't live through Jim Crow and the black American South, whatever. She has black skin and wasn't nobody asking her or checking for her or talking about our, was your family from Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, yeah. whatever. When they mm -hmm. see her, she's a beautiful black woman. And I just want us to not, I want us as content creators to create enough work for them that they're, everybody can eat. And that's my goal is to create these worlds that have such black, great black characters that everyone can come eat and come get some of this work. And I think you're doing that in all of the work that you do, you give a di like such variety of different types of characters, especially female characters that I'm like, hats off to you. You are amazing. Um, and I am a fan of you forever. So oh, you're making me blush. I know. So I have to wrap it up. But my la the last question, which sort of it says that you had some Marvel news drop and people are excited for that. But can you talk about what else is in the Anyabuchi pipeline that's coming? What other stories are coming from you? Okay. So, I know you got a lot cooking. Yeah. So, you know, the next steps in building the Onyebuchi media empire <laughs> are... <laughs> Nigerian excellence. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so the, the Marvel news, I have um, a, a short sort of one shot in the Marvel Voices uh, uh, legacy anthology that I'll be dropping next February. Um, I wrote a really dope story there. It was my very first like comic story. So super excited about that. Um, my next adult novel, Goliath, is slated for winter 2022. It's so dope. It's, it's, uh, it's like, I love that book so yeah. much and so i'm in the midst of edits for that now um and that's proceeding apace uh april uh, this upcoming april april 2021 i have my non-fiction my long-form non-fiction debut dropping skin folk which is ostensibly uh, a critical analysis of americana by chimamanda ngozi adichie that also spins out into memoir and my basically my political and sentimental awakening with regards to American blackness. Oh, um, so, so, yeah. oh I can't wait. I can't oh, wait for the big snatch. It's, it's gonna be like <laughs> it's 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 lit. Um but yeah also like you know there and then of course there's all the stuff that I can't talk about but exactly. you, know, you know just just watch this space over the next like eight years or so. Awesome or eight, eight months or so yeah. Tochi has some amazing short story in a collection that I edited called The Universe of Wishes that comes out in December, December 8th. And it is phenomenal. So much so that the editor like was weeping and was like, this is the mic drop story in the collection, which we hope at some point you turn into a full novel because I do think you have something there that you're scratching at that is like impeccable and amazing. So December 8th, 
get excited for that. Zoraida Cordova is also in it. Fabulous story um, in that. And yeah, it's going to be a good a good year. I have something big announcing tomorrow that I'm very excited about. If you I saw, saw. y'all, you, oh man, that and that. So there's the, it was this, it's this series of photos. There's about six of you in the black and white and y'all, every single one of you look like you're about to start some trouble. Oh yeah, this is trouble. That's also, trouble. What, what, what time is that announcement? It comes at 11 a.m. tomorrow. So keep your eye on the social media. It's our sort of trying to break the internet and also do something for our community. Um, mm -hmm for our children and so yeah i'm just excited trying to really use quarantine and use this downtime and like all of the stress and and put it in the work uh and try to make really good stuff like i said so that everybody can can, can come and eat yeah. and i think it's important for us to to do that um est yes we are on the uh east coast um so so yeah i'm really excited here comes Uncle Bobby's to come take us off the screen because <laughs> with a hook Sorry. like in the Apollo. <laughs> exactly the Apollo. It's like, oh no. The Sandman, the Sandman. Yes. Yo, that was you guys are you guys are too much. That was great. <laughs> Um, I feel like this was just what just what we needed. It really hit the spot. Um, just what a great celebration of Black excellence. You really both brought your A-game. Audience, you also brought it with the comments. Yes. <laughs> oh, so good. Thank you both so much for, for coming out tonight. Um, this was such a pleasure. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to like more buzz around Rebel Sisters. And everything else that both of you have go going on. Oh, I hope that one day um, after yeah. all of this is settled, um, we can have you come visit the store, Uncle Bobby's in Philly. Oh, say you. less. Say mm -hmm. less. We will get on that train. Tochi and I will be on that train. We will yep. be down there like, what's up? Yeah. Party time. <laughs> awesome. Love Thanks, you. everyone, for tuning in tonight. This was awesome. Yes. Tochi, love you. Love you more. Talk to you offline. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for coming. Me. Thank you. That was a good night. That was a very good night. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye.